Hi everyone, um, today's case is a mini video and the reason I'm doing this one is to tell you about a very dangerous man, a man who is now free again. Just a um, trigger warning, I will be discussing rape of different vulnerable people and abortion. Um, so if that's something that you don't think you want to listen to or can't listen to at the moment that's fine um i hope to have another video out this week so you can just leave this one alone for now thank you again for the support um if you're okay with going forward we will i will ask that um because i'm going to speak about certain people and stuff as well so i would like to ask that comments and stuff are kept civil and that does no i'm not i'm not trying to cause drama or cause debates and stuff like it. debates are good but not hateful debates um yeah so we're just gonna get straight into it simon mcginley is originally from monaghan and he is from one of the largest traveling clans in ireland at the time that our story begins on august 27 1997 mcginley is a married father of three some sources say that at this time he is living in dundalk but while i tell the story about his home it seems that where he is staying or living at the time is actually in Dublin, it's in Balgaddy, which is an area kind of in between Lucan and Clondalkin. So on this night, McGinley and his wife were out and a 13 year old girl from a neighbouring um, traveller family who, you know, who they knew was babysitting their children. And when they arrived back, 24 year old McGinley insisted on driving the girl home. So they got into his van and on they went. But as they passed her halting site in Clendalkin, um, she asked, where are you going? And he said that he was heading up the road to get cigarettes. But then he pulled in to the entrance of like a council depot. He leaned over and punched her. And then he began to undress her, pull her into the back, continue to beat her and rape her repeatedly. This must have been going on for a while because McGinley's wife went out looking for him. And she came upon the van. And when she banged on the van, McGinley looked out, pushed her away, and then jumped into the driver's seat naked and drove for about half a mile. While he was driving, the girl started to dress herself. And then when he pulled over to get dressed himself, she tried to make a run for it. But he caught her, and again, he beat her. After this ordeal, he dropped her home. But before letting her go, he held a knife up to her and threatened that if she was to report it, he'd cut her up. The girl's mother wasn't there. She was now actually out with McGinley's wife looking for him. The 13-year-old, who was the eldest of 12, would go on to tell her parents that she had been raped. They brought her to Crumlin Children's Hospital and she was um, examined, you know, given treatment and also given the morning after pill. So the family were also threatened that they weren't to report this to the guardie. Um, in interviews later with the girl, she would say, you know, about certain topics and stuff being um, taboo or, you know, that they're kept, you know, insular. And I think maybe that's what happened here. Maybe it's kind of a case of, you know, we'll deal with it. But a third party actually went to the Guardian and reported it 18 hours later. The girl and her family lived in squalid conditions. Um, and, they you know, I think they were kind of on just a, a roadside holding site. So there wasn't um a lot of amenities set up for them as there would be in other halting sites so i think between this i think they were already kind of at the attention of social services but when it got out then that she had been raped social services took her into care and she was placed with a foster family in the midlands weeks passed and the girl began feeling nauseous and vomiting every day so the foster mother brought her to the doctor and she was given uh, she gave a urine sample the following morning, she would arrive down to the kitchen and there would be the foster mother and social worker sitting around the kitchen table and they would tell her that she was pregnant. The 13 year old would later say that she was, you know, she said like, what's pregnant? She, she would say because of, you know, being the eldest of so many children, she didn't get to go to school. You know, she kind of had to stay home and look after. So I think she was quite young and naive even for 13. And so she said that, you know, she said to them, what's pregnant? And they said, it means you're going to have a baby. So obviously, you know, a social worker informed her parents and told them of the, the devastating news. And 
they went to court. They actually went to children's court to kind of figure out what they were going to do. And it is said that the parents, her parents actually, they were the one who brought up the option of going to England for an abortion. Side note for anybody um, not familiar. At this time in Ireland, abortion kind of of any standing is illegal. So people would have to go to England um, to get an abortion. There was a case in 1992 called the Miss X case and that was kind of the first one that gave uh, precedent to you know a rape victim being allowed to go over to get an abortion you can look into that more there's more obviously in uh, detail involved but this girl would become known as Miss C so as I said it seems it was her parents who actually brought that option up to the courts about going and it said that her father broke the news to media. You know, he spoke to newspapers and had a radio interview and stuff where he said, we really want to get our daughter to England to have an abortion for her own safety. Now, it seems within days, her father, the parents, changed their mind. They had been contacted by um, pro-life anti-abortion groups. And it seems then they decided no they didn't want her to have an abortion and they wanted her back in their care so then it became the miss c case so it was basically her parents against the eastern health board and her a psychiatric report would say that if she had to follow through with the pregnancy she had you know she was at risk of suicide and um, one report did say that she said if she had to have the baby she would end her life because it's not her baby you know it isn't my baby Going to court, her parents would be, you know, accompanied by these pro-life groups. They they would um, pay for accommodation, you know, legal advice, taxis, stuff like that. The children's court ruled that she could go to England. Um, the parents then went to the high court with this to try and get it overturned, but they upheld the original ruling. So in December 1997, the girl, her foster mother and some social workers travelled to England and the pregnancy was terminated. Going back to the investigation, um, Gardy knew, you know, that McGinley was responsible or, you know, that he had been identified as the culprit. But for months they couldn't find him. They looked in places that he was known to be. So, so Monaghan, Loud, other areas all over Ireland. And then on November 21st, 1997, McGinley's father actually approached a detective that he was, you know, familiar with. And the two of them drove to Dundalk where Simon McGinley, you know, appeared, presented himself, whatever. And the three went back down to Dublin and he was arrested. McGinley would initially claim that he was seduced by the 13 year old and the sex was consensual. Sex with any child, no matter what situation, cannot be consensual. In October 1998, the case went to trial. McGinley pled guilty, but this was only after the jury and all had been sworn in. So really, you know, at the 11th hour, DNA from the aborted fetus was, you know, uh, tested and proven that the father, the biological father, would have been Simon McGinley. The now 14 year old told the court through a video link that she hopes he gets locked up for life. The victim impact statement obviously included all the, the trauma that followed. And uh, his defence would argue, you know, well, that wasn't at his, that wasn't because of his direct actions, you know. But, I mean, if he didn't rape her, the rest of it wouldn't have happened. The defence also spoke about how he had drank 10 pints that night and smoked cannabis. I, like, I don't even know. To be honest, I don't even know the, the purpose of it, acknowledging that because drink doesn't make someone a rapist. Drink doesn't make someone a murderer. This, that's something inherent in you. Mr. Justice John Quirk would tell uh, McGinley, you have deprived her of some of her childhood and all of her adolescence. You do not seem to appreciate the enormity of what you have done. The judge sentenced McGinley to 12 years with four suspended. He said he was taking into account the fact that he had no previous convictions. He seemed to be a good provider for his family and that he pled guilty. Um, even though it was at the, like, you know, the last minute, it meant that the girl didn't have to testify and go through that trauma. As part of this sentencing, though, and the leniency, he had to undergo counselling and therapy, which he would. He would take part in sex offender programmes in um, Arbor Hill. McGinley was released after six years. And I wish that I could say that the story ended there, but it doesn't. On the 16th of June, 2008, McGinley, once again drunk, knocked at the cottage of an 85-year-old woman in Monaghan. 
When she opened the door, he pushed past into the house. His original plan was to burgle her. But then he decided, so to be honest, I doubt that that was his original um, mission. He decided then to stay throughout the night, raping her repeatedly. To be honest, I don't know how he got caught for this one. Um, was she able to describe him or identify him? And they just knew, you know, that he had been released kind of the, the couple of years previous and put two and together, two and two together. I don't know, but they arrested him and his fingerprints would be found in her kitchen, in her bedroom, her bathroom. And his DNA would be found on her pajamas and her electric blanket. Honestly, my heart hurt when I read about the little electric blanket. He would deny these charges, but the case went to trial the following year in 2009. Judge Birmingham said that this crime was as bad as it could get. The woman had been um, diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia and she had given a, t a statement to the district court. And then by the time it came to the trial at the criminal court, she was unfit to testify, but her statement was read out. Her daughter would say, that you know she had lost the joy in her life um she could no longer live independently it had accelerated the dementia she was terrified if she saw someone walk past the window mcginley was found guilty and sentenced to 21 years with two suspended to be honest i'm, su I'm surprised that that's a that's a decent sentence um it's the longest i've ever heard of a sex offender getting for for a crime regardless of of how horrific it was so 21 years is, is good going. Miss C attended the trial and she would say that she was relieved to see that he got such a long sentence. I'm just, I'm going to say as while I was going through this case, uh, I came across some, some sources that weren't like new sources in the sense that there's one called um, the Free Library. And so I found a source on that if you want to go look it up because I'm not going to actually really talk about it because like that it's not from a newspaper per se. Now it lists the newspaper that it comes from. It says it's from one of the English newspapers. But then I couldn't find the original so I just didn't want to say. But anyway, it talks about how... Do you know what, I will say it. But disclaimer, I'm not sure how uh, reputable the source is and I'm sure people are going to give out to me for that. But anyway, one of the sources says is that his mother, Mary shouts at the victim's children you should have put her in a home also his mother apparently gave out to the media you know saying like my son's not a monster and um uh, like he didn't murder anyone it's also reported that his wife and children attended the trial so he seemed to still have support of his family and stuff as part of his sentencing he was told that after release he would be under um 12 years post-release supervision which again is is fairly good it's not the best it's fairly good which we will come to and now we are at today or th this year present today the, the present in august 2022 after 13 years served mcgillney was released he is now just coming up to 50 years old he was covered completely. He was picked up by a taxi. So he was covered completely. I'll show the picture. This, the, that's, that's the only picture they have of him now. Um, he has a hood up, a big bulky jacket, all this. And no one comes to get him. But it is said that his family have stood by him. You know, whether he has still has the little moustache or not. But so the only picture I have is from obviously 2009. He has links to like that Monaghan, uh, Loud, the north of Ireland and England. So it's kind of said that he might go anywhere. Now, one of the sources actually, um, Crime World by Nicola Talent, that's how I came across this case. That, that's a brilliant podcast. If you like listening to crime podcasts, I would uh, recommend it. She puts out loads and I just like Nicola Talent. So they, she has Eamon Dillon on, I think is his name. And so he's actually giving out like about the fact that once he was released, the same with kind of Larry Murphy and everybody else, once they're released, they have seven days, they get a week to tell the Gardaí where they're going to be residing. An entire week. I don't know why that's not a thing like you should know before you're leaving. Like even if it's that you have to go to like a hostel or a halfway house or one of these places, 
it should be determined before you leave, you know? Instead of giving you the opportunity to do whatever you want for a week, run riot if you wanted to, run amok and no one knows where you are. The other thing he was giving out about was the electronic tagging, which is what I was saying when I said, oh, he's under 12 years post-release. At the moment, I brought, put it up before, but at the moment there is no like electronic tagging or anything. And Eamon actually said it would cost only between like 10 to 20 euro a day to, you know, per person obviously, to do this. But it would be worth the money if they can keep track. Um, like he used the example of McGinley, like they basically say McGinley, you know, suffers from alcoholism and this is kind of why he does his crimes. And so the judge actually said like, if he never, if that's never addressed, everyone is at risk. Everyone will continue to be at risk if that isn't addressed. And Eamon was saying, like, you know, they could they could see then if he was at a pub, you know, this type of thing like that. Like, surely I would think maybe even that should be part of your, like, conditions of being released, maybe. I don't know. In fairness, I don't know how, how they'd get away with that in Ireland because of our attitude and culture towards drink. But I don't know. Anyway, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent. One little note said that Detective Alan Bailey, you know, I would have spoke about him in terms of um, Ireland's Missing Women and, and Larry Murphy and stuff like that. And it is said that at one point, he says that at one point, uh, McGinley was considered like a person of interest for Jojo Dullard's um, disappearance. And then it says that it was kind of, it was brushed away then because the person who had given the information had made it up or, you know, was making up stuff about the person. Now, once again, disclaimer, because this is just me thinking. When I was reading and writing all this kind, you know, making up my, my script yesterday, um, I actually thought, do you remember in Alan Bailey's book, like I would have talked about how Alan said, the the traveller uh, who, you know, kept like asking them to come visit him and stuff like this. And he said that him and his uncle had, had kidnapped, you know, a woman and then they'd done another woman because... Like he was afraid of his uncle and his uncle abused him and, you know, this and that and stuff like that. Now, again, complete speculation on my part. Don't come at me. But. And then again, like that, there were other other sources that talk about him being like suspect for other crimes and stuff. Um, again, so I won't go into them. If you want to literally just look up Simon McGinley and do a little bit of looking and you'll see what I'm talking about, that they're talking about, you know, that he had been suspect for other things and even kind of it was known within the community that he would you know do illegal things uh, and to be honest personally I would think that the 13 year old wasn't the first situation uh, I feel like the attitude at the time and I feel even the fact of his wife like coming up like I feel like it's such a blase thing like to be knocking on the knocking on the door and he just off oh, pushes you away and drives off like don't be annoying me kind of thing um so i feel like he probably did have a reputation or a past already again it's just speculation but i would doubt that the 13 year old was the first incidence of something wrong and judging by you know what they've said like that they have said on release that he is high risk Again, they said that if he doesn't address the alcoholism, he is at, like everyone is at risk. And obviously we've seen that he will go after the most vulnerable people in society. So, yeah, I would be worried. And I think they need to keep an eye on him. And I don't think that that would be his last offence if he can help it. Just a follow up for um, Miss C. In 2009, she spoke to the Pat Kenny show. And she spoke about how she struggled with the abort you know having the abortion and that it was harder to deal with than the rape she said that she had you know gone through counseling she was on medication she had tried to take her life her father sadly did take his life um and she would she would say like that about how like abortion and suicide and things like this were very much frowned upon isn't even probably the word but you know they were they weren't accepted in the community and I'm not trying to say that for like to paint the entire community as, you know, this thing. But this is a member of the traveling community telling us her experience that this is what happened, you know, and that she she says she still receives threatening phone calls and stuff. She would also do another interview in 2013 where she says that she now has a loving boyfriend. She's the mother of a little boy and girl. 
she says that she actually went on to get a death cert for the baby that had been aborted and that she named her Shannon. Again, I don't I don't know if kind of because of her age and the naivety and stuff like that, did she not really understand what abortion meant? I don't know, but she does say that if she if she had knew or fully understood, she would have went through with the pregnancy, but that she would have given the baby up for adoption. Now, again, I'm not getting into debates here. That is her experience. So, you know, uh, maybe for her life then, there was a psychiatric report that said she was at risk of suicide if she had to carry through with it. You know, it's there was already a lot of trauma and stuff. So I don't know. I'm just telling you what she has said. But I'm happy that she has gone on and she's, you know, got a happy, loving, loving family. And I hope that she is, you know, I hope that the counselling and stuff is helping her. So that's the story of McGinley, um, who is now out on release. And obviously, we don't know where he is. Obviously, hopefully, the Gardino. You know. When he was released in August, every local Garda station in Ireland had been notified about him being released. Um, yeah, so there's not much else I can really tell. And I hope that that is the end of it. Uh, yeah, I hope you're all well, as per, as per usual. Um, again, if you have any case suggestions, let me know. I will have another video out. I'm actually hoping it'll be out about two or three days after this one. So bear with me. And yeah, if you have any case suggestions, send them on. If you want to tell me what you think about this case, about this video, again, please keep things respectful and, you know, above board. And yeah, so we will see you in the next video. Thanks. Bye.